right, hello. Uh, my name is Martin Howard. We are talking today about telehealth. Uh, we are uh, excited about being joined by two extraordinary practitioners who I will introduce in a moment. Myself, I've been a healthcare IT professional for over 40 years now, uh, starting out with uh, the Maryland Hospital Association, but largely my career has been on the provider side as a chief information officer, hospitals, home health, post-acute care, pharmaceutical services. I also spent 13 years with the big four and have been in over 500 healthcare organizations in my career. I'm very delighted to be joined by two folks who have actually uh, done and accomplished important and impactful um, things in the telehealth space. Uh, Jasmine Bishop has led technology development and broadband expansion and implementation uh, of telehealth systems for hundreds of hospitals in California and has come across the country and is now working uh, in the same vein in Maine where she's not only working for Maine Telehealth and, uh, but also a gubernatorial appointment uh, for, for Maine's telehealth system. And also thrilled to be talking with uh, Dr. Tracy Halbuena, uh, a board certified emergency physician who's been involved uh, for over 10 years in, um, in telehealth, um, also in Maine, uh, and has been part of not only direct patient care, but part of innovative startups such as uh, Call9, MD Live, and CityBlock. So with that, I would like to uh, turn to them for some introductions and to tell you more about, about themselves. So uh, we wanna start with Jasmine. Sure, thank you for that introduction, Marty. I'm happy to be here with you both. I have been in the telehealth space my entire career, so a little over a decade, and working with um, all players in the telehealth space. So our health plans, our providers, our executive teams, and the health systems, and most importantly, our patients. And so I'm really excited to share a little bit of what we've learned during this past uh, decade or two since telehealth has been known, if not uh, a household name until COVID, and then to also talk with you about what the future could look like when we talk about digital health in healthcare. Great, and Dr. Halbuena? Hello, I'm Tracy Halbuena, emergency physician. I'm also very happy to be here um, talking with you today. I uh, initially uh, started uh, really exploring the innovation in telehealth in the mid 2000 and teens and have found it to be a fabulously creative and innovative and really inspiring field that mixes a whole uh, bunch of different dimensions that are fascinating to me. It's the combination of basic medicine, um, healthcare delivery, um, technology, and then team building and process design and system design. Um, that is so fascinating to me. The questions that we are facing in at that intersection are really meaty and very impactful to patients. So I'm very excited to have this conversation with you today. Great. You know, one of the things, uh, and, and Jasmine talked about, uh, you know, telehealth for 10 years. Uh, I, I think in doing a little background for this, we found a uh, 1924 uh, article in Radio Magazine about uh, the future of telehealth. Telehealth actually became practical as early as 1959 uh, when radiology images started being uh, sent uh, over, over the airwaves uh, and over wires. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's many, many decades ago. Uh, telehealth has been up and coming for years and years now. Um, the industry as a whole, uh, healthcare has been slow uh, up until a year ago, right? and I think probably still fax machines are, are still uh, considered high technology and widely in use in healthcare. Uh, COVID obviously has created a dramatic increase. Um, I, I saw a quote from uh, Mayo as early as a year ago. So we're talking, uh, you know, in the early, much earlier in the pandemic, when uh, they said that uh, developments they expected to take 20 or 30 years have happened in six months to a year. 
So um, I'd like to get your reaction in terms of that kind of pace when you're an industry that takes, uh, you know, 10, 15 years uh, to, to change a reimbursement, to begin to change a reimbursement platform or protocols. Uh, what's been your experience, especially when you uh, both were involved before, before COVID, uh, about how things have changed so rapidly and, and how that's, uh, how you've dealt with that? Yeah, I can jump in here. I will share a little vignette of my early experience in telehealth and in California, where I initially started doing technology sales for our underserved and rural populations. So we're talking about critical access hospitals, federally qualified health centers, and rural health centers. Now, when people think of California, they often, if they're not from there, think of the beach, the coast, and maybe some mountains. But we have a lot of rural areas inland, and you can drive for hours and not see very much. Um, and I was on one of those types of drives to one of our rural health centers with a large clunky telemedicine cart in my back. At the time it was in the back of my car. At the time it was, you know, cutting edge. It was the, the hottest thing on the market. And I'm bringing it uh, to this clinic who is just over the moon to be able to have it because it's grant funded. And so we would, um, install these telehealth carts in the exam rooms. And so I'd walk in, roll the cart in and have a whole bag of uh, tools so that I can get it all set up and plugged in and tested. And during one of these trips, I found myself in an exam room for a couple of hours. And at one point, a doctor walks by the front door of the exam room and says, you know, he looks very disgruntled and he looks me up and down and he looks the technology up and down and he says to me, oh, is that my replacement? And that was the um, perception that we would come across in the physician community and the patient community overall in healthcare. Um, so much so that even with this great grant funding for years, once the grant dried up, or the individual physician that was championing the service had left or moved on to another initiative. I can't tell you how many carts we found in the corners, dusty, in coat closets. Um, we have pictures of the craziest places we've seen them in bathrooms being used as uh, coat closets, actually with coats hanging on the carts. Right. You know, and so we've seen this interesting situation where the technology has been there a bit longer than the desire to implement it. And I think when we really started to get some traction um, was after everyone had dust settled around implementing EHRs. I think from 2001 to 2014, when they were mandated uh, across large health systems, to move to electronic health records, people just didn't want to hear about another large scale technological innovation. It just right. was not something that was on their radar and they just couldn't take on another tech innovation. Um, since then, and you, your point was Marty around the last year, but even since then we've seen a lot of um, at least interest, not necessarily full blown support from um, our payers and from necessarily leaders in larger health systems, but certainly more interest of how people can use technology to support their health systems and where they might be able to do more of that. And then we saw what happened with COVID and, you know, uh, there you go. Right. Is the mother of invention, as we all know. And, and so that's, that's been our experience. And I'll toss it over to you, Tracy, to speak specifically from a provider's perspective. But I did want to give that kind of long lens on what it's been like the last couple of decades implementing sure. that. You know, in the clinical realm, people work hard. They're stressed. They always have more tasks than they can, than they feel like it can possibly accomplish in any given day. So they are operating in what feels like a zero sum game. 
So there, and then if you pair that with the fact that any new workflow or new innovation is sort of an endothermic reaction in which you have to put some energy in in the beginning before you can see the results of the reaction afterwards, feels uh, there, there is a high uh, burden of proof, so to speak, that this is gonna be good, this is gonna be worthwhile. Um, and you have to have a clinical team that either has the impetus because it's necessary and or the extra energy and time to put that energy into the endothermic reaction to get that desired outcome. So I think that speaks to what Jasmine just alluded to, which was the reluctance to engage in other technological innovation right after the mandated electronic health records um, time period, because it was another endothermic reaction that was gonna have to be engaged in. Yeah, um, and, and I in the think, time of the pandemic, of course, that provided the impetus to break those uh, bonds, those chemical bonds, so to speak, and gave that energy required to get over that energy hump. And now it's um, sort of a wide open field. Once you get the uh, habits developed and some of the processes in place, uh, for these new innovations to actually be implemented and for people to be actually using them in the clinical sphere, it takes less energy at each interaction to get people to use them. So I think we've gotten over some of that endothermic hump by this point. I think that's actually quite uh, a quite generous way to describe it. Uh, as, as someone, again, who's been involved in the IT side of this, uh, I, I think you know I, IT people tend to... Uh, to accuse uh, physicians and practitioners of being re reluctant to adopt a new technology. And, and I think they're reluctant to because most of the time we don't do it right, or we don't think of the actual practitioner's need, or like you said, the amount of extra work involved. And uh, you know, one of my favorite statements is, unless you're a technology company, there's no such thing as an IT project. And you know, an EHR is used by physicians and revenue cycle people, and they're the ones who need to drive how it works, how it operates, what results it gets, not, not uh, people from the technology side. Uh, you know, one, one of the interesting pieces also is I don't think it's just physicians. Uh, I, I'm thinking uh, one, one of my hobbies is to do home repair. And so electrical work, plumbing, you know, plumbers, uh, when copper pipe first started getting replaced, uh, you know, by by plastic, you have the same thing, right? They're re re reluctant to adopt to new technology. I think it's a human thing, uh, not something in the purview of just providers. You know, one of the things that is on the 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 everyone's mind is is reimbursement, right? Where during the pandemic and reimbursement drives, um, you know, we we are a capitalist country and reimbursement drives uh, much about the healthcare system. And one of the sad things I saw. Uh, prior to COVID, when telehealth was available, is with lower reimbursement rates, providers would sometimes insist on in-person visits because the reimbursement was higher. I get, you know, $48 if they show up in person, $15 or nothing if I talk to them on the phone or over video. Um, so, you know, there's a, a financial hit. Parity has made a huge difference. Uh, and there's a lot of concern over what rates are going to look like in the future. Obviously, payers want to pay less. Uh, so, again, in terms of either specifically in the main system now or within your careers, what, uh, what do you think about the impact of reimbursement? Is the uh, horse out of the barn and people are adapting to televisits so rapidly that it's not going to go back? Or do you think reimbursement pressures might change behavior? I think that to your last um, part of that question is really crucial to focus in on is the piece of calling them televisits and thinking about what is it that we're even talking about today in terms of telehealth? Are we talking about the interaction that the three of us are having over video? And in some places we're calling that telehealth or telemedicine, others virtual visits or video visits. And so I think to focus and narrow in on that space and to identify the space we're talking about would be to acknowledge why didn't we see the amount of utilization before COVID that we've seen since. 
Is it that more people wanted it? Well, sure, they had a requirement and a necessity to move from the in-person work to virtual in an effort to maintain that continuity of care and keep seeing their patients. But there was a huge catalyst that we've all talked about and know about, which is the reimbursement and the CMS piece and big barriers being pulled away. Some of those key barriers that everyone talks about and it really is, needs to be repeated because it is so crucial. It's the ability for us to care for patients when they're physically in their homes. We did not have that reimbursement at a federal level for Medicare before COVID. And it is not guaranteed once the public health emergency ends. And so that's really where most eyes are on is focusing our lobbying efforts and writing our letters and talking to our legislators about the very high importance of maintaining full parity, being paid the same amount for the patients being seen physically in their home versus the patients being seen in person in the clinic. And really what it is, uh, is about trusting our provider community to know when a visit is clinically appropriate and know that you can trust the you know, the patients are trusting their providers and patients have mechanisms to select different providers if they don't trust them. And so there, there is a modicum of trust that happens in a health system. And we need to be able to trust the providers and put in checks and balances, uh, of course, to be able to audit that trust. Uh, but that's, that's the bottom line is knowing that our provider community are not going to suggest or try to bill for a surgery remotely but they might and they should consider if possible and if the patient wants to do so, pre-surgical appointments, post-surgical follow-ups, make sure that the patient doesn't actually have to get into that car when they're covered in sutures and have to risk tearing you know, one of those sutures. It's, it's important to acknowledge that there's more to this than just the reimbursement and there's way more to it than, oh, it's convenient for the doctor. It's about better patient care. We have our community members that are maybe have multiple children and it's hard for them to get to the doctor's office and get all the kids in the car and travel, or they have to take time off work. They have to hire someone to care for their kids while they do this. I mean, there's a, there's a whole list of reasons. And I think that people talk about them well um, on why we should keep the reimbursement for patients' mm -hmm. homes, but that's the biggest reimbursement arena that is on people's minds right now. The second biggest would be the phone visits. And phone visits mm -hmm. is saying that we're gonna have the same exact interaction, except we wouldn't be able to see one another. That seems obvious, but it's important to call out what it is we're talking about. And in the reimbursement world, we call those audio only visits. Again, back to trusting the clinical team that they would only leverage these tools when it was clinically appropriate. And why would our patients need that? There's a whole host of them. We have patients that have certain diagnoses like um, schizophrenia or paranoia where they are very uncomfortable being being seen over video. We have patients that don't have access to internet like um, right. in our rural communities, especially. And then we have patients that don't have a video enabled device, especially our patients um, that you know might not, even if they had one, know how to use it. So we have a whole um, list of reasons why we want to maintain both reimbursement for our home for video as well as for the audio space. Good point. I wanna, yeah. I wanted to speak to that trust issue that you just brought up, Jasmine, because as an innovation uh, provider, doctor that's involved in quality and research, I feel very strongly that it is um, medicine's obligation to uh, earn and uphold and maintain that trust. And that involves several different components. One is the continuing development of a body of research, of high quality research that shows us where telehealth tools produce good clinical outcomes and where it doesn't. So that we know 
where it's useful for patients, where it's good for patients, and therefore where we should put more resources and where we should focus our attention on process development and tool development. That's one. Two is the continuation of the development of sort of the translation of that body of uh, esoteric evidence into operational and clinical practice. How do we give guidance to our practices about how to operationalize that evidence? In term, and I'm thinking of things like inclusion and exclusion criteria. What kind of guidance should we give our practices about what patients are appropriate for video visits or audio only of visits? And what are the lists of considerations that they need to factor in when they're trying to decide which patients to offer this type of visit to? And then three is making sure that we have a really robust retrospective quality control program in the sense of having some process or mechanism by which we can flag potential problem cases, investigate them, look at them, do root cause analyses if we need to, so that we can incorporate the lessons that we learn from that into future workflows to continue making, you know, bake in the solutions to future workflows. Um, and I think that if um, programs and healthcare systems uh, can leverage all three of those, evidence, the, you know, sort of research high quality evidence, translating that evidence into practice at the practice level, and then retrospective case review to make sure that we learn lessons from when things didn't go very well, that we will go a long way towards earning and continuing to earn that trust that we need in order to show people why these services should be reimbursed appropriately. Yeah, right. That's, uh, I think, spectacularly important points, right? We, uh, with, with the concept of that, you know, income should come from outcomes, right? I mean, that's been a, a theme for, uh, you know, the, the move toward patient-centered care has been talked about for 40 years now. Uh, Value-based care, bundled payments, payment for outcomes, you know, has been a theme forever. Uh, patient trust, and if I can take a little bit of a contrarian view and with a, 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 a context that I'm from the Bronx, so uh, you know, a little ex excuse there. Uh, because video visits are easy, and uh, people like them, right? All the data show that uh, patients like talking to a doctor. If you're if you're homebound, just that connection with other people is nice. There's also the opportunity, and and I know that audits are going on now, right? For waste, fraud, and abuse, for over prescribing, in a sense, it's there's a lot less bad outcome associated with over prescribing too many video calls than there is unnecessary surgery or, or procedures that are, are not necessarily the best. So there's also the opportunity, unfortunately, and there's always some bad players out there to say, well, my patient needs five calls a week or my, you know, that when, when there isn't that evidence. And we do know that in terms of reimbursement, private payers as well as Medicare, and just as you're talking about, uh, Dr. Halbuena, the, the research, and it's good there's enough volume now to get some, but without that evidence, we, we know from the history of mental health reimbursement and others that without that uh, incontrovertible statistical evidence that the likelihood of being reimbursed is unfortunately small. So the uh, National Quality Forum, which is one of our national organization that stewards quality measures, and you probably right. are familiar with them, produced a, essentially a white paper report uh, from their telehealth task force. This was September of last year, so in the time of the pandemic. And they, I thought one of the most useful concepts that came out of that report was the following. Any kind of telehealth initiative could be thought of as belonging to one or more of the following categories. One, substitution for in-person care. So one for one trading in-person visit for a telehealth visit. Two, prevention of more costly care. Three, lower no-show rates. Four, transitions of care, so discharge from home to yeah. hospital, home, what have you. And then three, the whole area of skilled nursing facility. That's a whole nother ballpark. Um, and the, I think important to note to your point was the difference between number one and two, substitution for in-person care versus prevention of more costly care, because it speaks to utilization and right. patient utilization, right? So substitution of in-person care is a direct trade, one for one. Whereas prevention of more costly care might actually result in 
uh, first pass increase utilization. So more visits, more PCP office encounters with the patient, but the goal is that it's gonna prevent decompensation of their chronic condition on the down the line, which will prevent even more costly care later on. And so a part of doing the research on the various telehealth modalities is to make sure that we are conceptualizing things this way and that we are measuring those things. And uh, in, in pairing that with the outcomes so that we actually get a handle on the utilization and the benefit that comes from utilization so that we can answer the question that you just brought up, which was, are you just increasing utilization with no benefit? Well, we're gonna be able to do research to answer that question, right? So that's, I thought that was a very useful rubric for conceptualizing uh, the potential benefit of telehealth modalities from the NQF. I think those are excellent points. And, and Jasmine, something you talked about earlier as well, the, I guess what gets referred to as the digital divide, it seems ironic that something where, uh, you know, that most of us think of as pretty ubiquitous uh, that uh, we can see as the move to video visits uh, makes uh, makes a lot of life easier. And, and to your point about going to the doctor, there was a 2016, I think, survey that said uh, the average going to a doctor visit is a $43 expense on average, even before any medical bills, just from missed time at work or transportation costs or needing childcare, uh, you know, not to mention just the stress of, of getting from place to place in, in, in many locations. But is there a risk that by uh, rapidly moving towards telehealth, we can actually uh, exacerbate or the digital divide will exacerbate the already uh, discrepancies, the bifurcation of healthcare and outcomes that we've seen uh, as in COVID uh, cases and treatment is, is, you know, is telehealth a way to fix it? Is it a way that is gonna make it worse or is it just, uh, just demonstrating or bringing to light uh, the further bifurcation uh, of the population? I think that's a great question, Marty. And I, it, there's absolutely a risk. And that's why we need to talk about it and why we want to have these types of discussions and we're all listening to one another uh, methods and tactics for addressing it. So first to acknowledge how telehealth increases the digital divide. Telehealth is creating additional access but it's only creating additional access for some of our patients. So therefore it's actually increasing the disparity in access between the patients that already had access challenges and then them not having this newfound access. And so that's really what we're talking about. We're saying that patients um, might have the opportunity to go in person and now they have the opportunity to stay home. Whereas we have other populations that already had challenges getting to the doctor in person, they have transportation challenges. Um, we often talk about two things, accessibility and affordability in a few different ways. So when you think about the digital divide, we first think about broadband. I started my career in broadband because it has always been the uh, Achilles heel, heel of telehealth when it comes to going to patients' home. You can't do it. You can't do video visits, I should say, if you don't have adequate broadband. And so there have been for decades programs to try to address this. I started working for an organization back in California that was implementing FCC funding that created a broadband backbone across the state that was dedicated to healthcare. So we were actually creating internet that was only for our healthcare sites. So that means that you actually have less people there. Um, one of my first uh, jobs, I was told, you know, the internet is like the highway. You know, what speed you have at your house, even if your vendor tells you it's a, you know, a gig or 500 megs, that's just your on-ramp to the highway. Then you have to deal with every other car that's on the highway. And what we're doing and what we have done with a dedicated broadband backbone, um, and California wasn't the only state to do this, is creating a whole different highway. So now you're not just talking about your on-ramp, you're talking about the actual method mechanism to get to, from A to B. Now you make real change. And so since then, and that was a good 15 years ago that that project started and it still um, exists. And we've 
seen uh, additional funding going to the affordability side. So that's about accessibility. I'm, I was speaking about health systems, but we have accessibility programs for a resident, a residential homes as well. The FCC just came out with another round of funding for these programs. Um, the Connected Care program is uh, dedicated to both accessibility, so making sure internet actually exists in that physical location. And then affordability, once it's there, can I afford it? Can I afford the data plan monthly? And if I can't, are there resources for me to access? And so that's the first step when I think of digital divide. And I'm fortunate to sit on our state's broadband uh, authority, which is the fiscal agent for all broadband bonds and grants that come into the state. And we're doing a lot of great work to try to expand this notion that we need to start first at making sure internet is available to all of our patients. Because it affects, and we've seen this during COVID, it affects far more than their healthcare. Kids couldn't get to school because it was all virtual. Um, we had a case very recently with our Connect Maine Authority where a Maine citizen was working for a company that sent them all home and expected them to just do their work from home. Well, his home didn't have good internet and they said, I'm really sorry, we wanna keep you on, but we can't until you get your internet fixed. We were fortunate enough to work with some vendors that were able to turn it around very quickly and he was able to get his job back within a couple of weeks. But you know, it's important to acknowledge that while we're talking about healthcare here, the broadband and digital divide issue affects far more uh, than just healthcare. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, shifting gears just uh, uh, for for a second here, uh, Dr. Halbuena, there's all sorts of um, surveys and reports on how uh, how patients uh, like uh, video visits and and how uh, everybody from children who are less afraid of their pediatricians when they're just on a screen as they were you know the scary thing of going to a doctor's office to the elderly who you know now that they can visit their grandkids video uh, are a lot more accepting of it than they were before but are there are there groups of patients who are distrusting or, or have you had experience with with folks or groups of people who um, uh, are put off by by video by telehealth Boy, this is a really interesting question one that we're actively looking at we're actually in the process of creating a paper for academic submission on our satisfaction experiences with telehealth at Maine Health during the pandemic. And it's a mixed bag. It's really a mixed bag. The issue in the, if you look in the medical literature, there are a lot of studies about patient satisfaction. However, they are, there's a lot of variability among those studies. They look at different outcomes. They use different measurement tools. They talk about different patient populations that all the, the studies were constructed different ways. Most of them are quite small in their end size in terms of the number of patients that they look at. And most of them look at very small slices of patient uh, population, pediatric neurology, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, older people with diabetes and hypertension both. And so it's very, very difficult to get a big, an overall grasp of sort of overall patient satisfaction because you're never comparing apples with apples. Uh, so it's sort of a, a tough literature to wrap your brain around right now. And in addition to the variability in the way the studies are constructed, they are producing sometimes contradictory results. A lot of studies find that older people like telehealth. A lot of studies find that they don't like telehealth. And so it, it's, I, th I think that for the most part, people like telehealth. Uh, the, the places where people find it less useful, I think are still unknown. And the reasons why in particular, the reasons why in particular, I think that is still an unanswered question. There's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, and I think there's also a um, just from the statistical, you know, uh, work that I've done, that there's also an inherent bias, right? People, you know, you're asking people if you did a video visit, did you like it? Well, <laughs> you know, there's there's a a selection bias there that says, well, you know, 
Yeah, of course. Uh, what a silly question. Uh, you know, if I, you know, they're not asking people who don't do video visits how they feel about video visits. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of the actually bigger problems with those sorts of studies is that there, even before there was a video visit, there was a selection step at the at the practice level that is mm -hmm. that sorted patients into those who are good candidates for video visits and those who are not. The patients who are not good candidates for video visits are more likely to be older, have comorbidities, have dementia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a whole bunch of medical reasons why they may not have been a good, uh, perfect candidate for a video visit that may affect their satisfaction on down the road. And so those studies are very difficult to interpret and really difficult to translate into actual practice guidelines because uh, I think as a field, we're not really sure yet exactly what the lessons are that we learn from them. Although I will say that there are many studies now underway that hopefully will start to answer a lot of these questions. The other thing that I would point out is that our surveys that are commonly used, Prescani, NRC, and so forth, were built without really considering this new modality. They're not geared to elicit that type of information from the patients. The questions weren't constructed with, with telehealth in mind. And I'll give you an example. In yeah. our data, we found that the net promoter score, which is you know an industry standard for would you recommend, which is commonly used as the measure for patient satisfaction, we found in our own data does not reflect patients' opinions about telehealth. The patients, when they're answering that, would you recommend question, they're not thinking about telehealth, even in a dedicated telehealth survey. And it gets it, we get, I could get into some, some complicated statistical, but the interpretation of our data is that, the upshot is that when they answer that question, they're thinking about their provider they're not thinking about the modality. So perhaps NPS is not the outcome that we should be looking at when we're trying to gauge patients' opinion about telehealth modalities. So for example, basic concepts like that, I think are still being worked out in the field. Yeah, this is, uh, this is very on that real quick. Yeah. I want to just acknowledge, Marty, just uh, thinking about our audience here and what is the takeaway? It's that we need to ask the question at the very beginning, right? We need to survey our patients and we need, and it might not be perfect. The tool might not be perfect. The question pod might not have been perfectly aligned for uh, digital health and virtual care. But if we start asking now, we'll have that really rich data, like what uh, Tracy and some of the other team are working on to analyze and start pivoting and making a difference. Um, I. I think that that in terms of a tangible takeaway, need to be surveying the, the patients and our providers as well and do something with the data, right? I mean, once we have that data, we have to do something about it. And you have to know if you're asking people to give you feedback that they expect you to do something with what they're telling you. Um, I think that that's really the I think the biggest takeaway here is that we want to make sure that our patients know that we care and we're not just filling a box that says we surveyed, that we've surveyed, we've put together research to understand the survey, and then after the fact, we've put in initiatives to fix it. A couple of examples I'll give on these types of um, shifts is around training. So we learn from our patients certain things about what happened in their visit. And so we can take those elements and we can train differently. A really easy to comprehend example is around Zoom screen sharing. If you share a screen on Zoom, if you share your whole screen and you minimize what you intended to share, people can see what was behind that on your screen. And that can create significant HIPAA violations if what was behind that was your EHR record with other patient information. And so we learned that not only through our patients' surveys telling us, Ooh, oops, accidentally saw XYZ thing, um, luckily not a HIPAA violation, just ended up not being what the person was trying to share, 
But we also learned it from this uh, other tangible <laughs> takeaway number two that Tracy did a great job of helping us um, even know we needed, which is make sure that you're in your patient safety reporting tool, you have a mechanism to tag that report as having anything to do with a telehealth visit. And that's also where we learned someone logged in as patient safety event, oops, accidentally yeah, showed this screen. And, and, you know, now we've added that to some of our provider training. So I think that those are three tangible takeaways is, you know, yeah, we, the safety, the, uh, the service, no, those, and communication. Yeah, no, I think those are, those are, again, excellent endpoints and uh, observations and terrific takeaways. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, HIPAA and privacy and, you know, those of us in the field as, as, as an I, I, IT person, right, that's always a huge concern. But um, I'm wondering if patients themselves are truly concerned. I, I note that in other industries and sectors where there have been major breaches at retail stores or health systems that hasn't had any impact people don't not go to a particular store because they read that that store had a data breach and so we in the field tend to think about hipaa and how secure are our platforms and all that but the, are, is that a concern you've heard from from patients or are patients worried that you know if they're talking to someone over video that somehow that data is less secure or they're less confidential than, than in an in-person visit? I think for the most part, the pressure really comes from the law rather than from, I feel as a, as a provider on the ground, I feel much more pressure from the law than I do from the patients. Mm -hmm. I still think it's the right thing to do. I think that a lot of times the patients don't always understand the implications of a HIPAA violation. So they may not feel it as saliently perhaps as they should because they're more focused on whatever concern it was that brought them to the interaction in the first place. There, there, is, there is an exception. I would say that uh, we, um, there is a potential scenario in which you have a group interaction. So there's a, some kind of clinician and then several patients and uh, those patient spaces are all visible in a screen, much like ours are all here now. And if one of those patients is not in a private setting, then whoever is in the background in that patient can see all the other patients on the screen. And a lot of times those group settings involve or can involve very sensitive topics such as um, some kind of a psychological therapy session or um, sub, uh, medication assisted treatment for substance use disorder and so forth. And I think in those circumstances, the patients feel the privacy issue more saliently than otherwise. Yeah, I was That's just yeah. going to acknowledge that, Tracy, and to your question, mm -hmm. Marty, is that do they know that they care about HIPAA? No. It's not HIPAA that they know they care about at all, but it is, uh, and we've seen it in our patient surveys, you know, people were walking behind my doctor. I didn't know who those people were. Now they're in a clinical setting. And of course those folks were clinically cleared to have that patient's information, but that that's not what the patient's asking. And so part of what we do is make sure that we write down in the patient's record and acknowledge who is in the room with me if I'm the provider and ask who's in the room with the patient because not only am I using a virtual background today, so you can't even see who's behind me, you wouldn't know if someone was sitting right behind my camera either. And so I think that's where patients, at least that's as far as I've seen patients and our community members uh, acknowledge what we think of as HIPAA is other people seem like they can hear me and I'm not really comfortable with that. So we've made sure to take those lessons and bake it into future workflows in which we put it in the guidance, the written guidance that we give to practices and how to conduct a video visit, and also in our training and education for our clinicians, sort of almost a scripting. I know a lot of clinicians hate that term scripting, but it is a way to get people in the habits that uh, check the boxes that need to be checked without having to expend um, so much cognitive energy at the beginning of every visit. One of them is to say to your patient, I'm in a private place. However, you might see my medical assistant walk behind me sometimes, is that okay? And then to document that. And then to do the same thing on the patient side who might be in the room with you, et cetera, et cetera. So we're taking some of these lessons that we learn 
uh, from reporting potential cases and try to bake it into our workflows in the future so that folks can make sure those things are addressed even before they would become issues and even before they would have to spend a whole lot of energy on thinking. That's, uh, that's, that's really, again, a good insight and, and at least something I hadn't uh, thought about because I know when you're in a doctor's office or certainly in a hospital or in a, uh, a, a radiology center or a lab getting blood drawn or whatever, whatever. There's, there's all these characters, right? Who no one knows who they are, uh, but it's different, right? In your home, right? you you expect a certain level of privacy uh, that, that you can intrude that these conferences can intrude on. So uh, you folks are in Maine um, and, and Jasmine, you went, you know, certainly cross country uh, California to Maine, I guess I uh, didn't stop too many places in between. So, you know, there's one of the, the cliches about healthcare in the U.S., right, is you've seen one state, you've seen one state. Uh, and, and so what uh, I think, you know, is, is different, what differentiates um, Maine? I mean, I, I assume we're not delivering lobster over the Internet or, or any other Maine specific thing like that. What, what else is uh, different or a differentiator about telehealth in Maine? Well, I did stop in all the states. I've driven cross country <laughs> six times. So I've stopped in literally all the states. And the biggest differentiator that I've seen is, uh, you know, surface level first. We don't have billboards in Maine. So there are no billboards in Maine. And that's important when it comes to telehealth. I learned recently on my last uh, road trip because we have a lot of states that use billboards now to market their telehealth programs. I saw several billboard that are marketing telehealth programs. I also saw billboards that were uh, marketing how long I would have to wait in their ER if I all of a sudden, God forbid, needed to go to their ER while I'm driving down the road, which I was very surprised by. And I think that's interesting. Um, that is part of the strategy for other states. And it gets down to a more granular strategy around we're in a very small state. Um, we're all the way up here in the Northeast, and there is less pressure on our healthcare system in terms of um, competition and market share and all those reasons why those companies have chosen to go to billboards on the freeway to talk about their ED wait times. Uh, but more granularly for telehealth, one of the reasons I came to Maine is because I really felt felt like I could make a difference here. Uh, I'd been working in California for many years, and the telehealth landscape, while certainly you know not mature, was uh, you know moving along quite well. And here in Maine, there has been a lot of work going on for years and years. But I think that there is even more of a ripe opportunity to use technology of all kinds to care for patients here. For folks that haven't been to Maine, we have a lot of islands off the coast and getting to and from the island is already a challenge um, in the summer. But imagine in the winter when the ferries aren't running any longer and you need to care for, and you need to get care. And so often our patients are having to wait for a ferry for a day. We've even had folks, our, I know care members, like physicians that take little planes and have to fly over to the islands to get to the clinics um, sometimes. And so what that means is when they finally can get to the mainland, they're spending a lot of time and a lot of money, often staying overnight. And that takes a toll on our, on our communities that already might not have the resources to be doing that in the first place, not to mention the absolute hassle and just not wanting to do that. <laughs> right. But even on our mainland, we have mountains and we have snow and we have, um, we're the oldest state in the entire nation. One in five of our uh, community members is over 65. We are also one of the poorest states in the nation outside of the coastal communities. And so we're talking about real resource challenges here with our populations. Um, and telehealth can maybe not solve all those problems, but it certainly can be a catalyst for change and for reaching some of our access goals. It could be the difference between a patient having to 
take that overnight trip to the mainland and being able to care, be cared for in their own home. Um, we have some really cool programs. We work for Maine Health, but there's great telehealth that's happening all across our state. There's a fantastic organization called the Maine Sea Coast Mission that's actually a telehealth system on a ship that goes from island to island to care for our island populations. Wonderful. And so we're doing some cool things up here to use technology to care for our patients. And I think that's what makes us unique. And I do need to acknowledge Maine Health also supports New Hampshire as well. Um, I wanted to speak to a couple of points about that. One is the older age of our population here. I think this is sort of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, there are patients who need a lot of uh, support. They're, you know, as you get older, you're more likely to have uh, chronic disease. And so that's a population that has, stands to gain a lot from telehealth. Um, in it, and in addition, the older people tend to have problems with mobility, travel is more difficult. Uh, and you combine that with the fact that we're very rural, this is a patient population that really stands to gain a lot from telehealth. On the other hand, there it all, also might be a patient population that has a lot of barriers to telehealth, namely with the technology. Uh, using the technology. And then if you factor in hearing impairment or visual impairment, it makes uh, interacting by video or audio that much more difficult. So we have to be think wisely and strategically about how to target that population to overcome those barriers. The second point I wanted to bring up was the rural nature of Maine and the fact that a lot of times our rural hospitals might be hours away from a tertiary care center. And it is a daily practice that happens every single day in the rural hospitals that a critically ill patient will be in the emergency department and will need tertiary care, uh, care, tertiary level care, but that transportation is an issue. And that can be for a whole slew of reasons. Often it's because of weather, weather will prevent the use of a helicopter. Um, and then, uh, and then more often, it's just because the long travel times combined with the um, volunteer nature of a lot of our EMS services makes the resource of a transportation um, vehicle uh, scarce. So that critically ill patient in an emergency department will wait for hours and hours and hours to be transported to the tertiary hospital for various reasons, as I mentioned above. Is that an opportunity for the use of telehealth in order to be able to connect the critical care doctor at the tertiary care hospital with the care team at the rural center? Yes, absolutely, 100%. And you could think of many other variations on this theme. Islands is a great one where you have a year-round island population that has an NP in a small clinic. And so there's a healthcare professional on the island. They're trying to decide does this patient that just came to my island clinic need to go to the mainland? Uh, I, boy, I wish I could have the ER doc on the mainland just take a look at this patient. Guess what? We have the technology to be able to do that now and have that triage step happen before the patient has to get on the ferry. So uh, I think that there are, we're just at the beginning of exploring the possible ways we could apply these new tools. Well, I think it, it's great that we we are right as we talked about at the very beginning of the conversation. Uh, healthcare has been very slow to adapt technologies that already exist. COVID has accelerated that mightily, and the opportunities that that both of you have talked about to improve outcomes, to improve population health at a, at a reasonable cost or even far lower cost than than the traditional methods is just a, a terrific thing. And the fact that it's, uh, that, that this pandemic has accelerated the development, we are so far ahead of where we'd be in all of these things. Uh, otherwise, if the normal pace of healthcare technology uh, acceptance had followed. So uh, also, I, I think I've learned from both of you the specifics, right? That, that populations are different, that rural and urban and wealthy and poor, and you know th these things all have very different needs, different populations. And there's, uh, although the same questions need to be asked uh, in, in every area for every population, the answers are quite different. Uh, and so um, 
I'd like to, to leave you with uh, many thanks. Uh, I have learned a whole lot. I hope the, the rest of us listening have as well uh, and want to congratulate and thank you for the impact that you've had for the people you've served both directly and indirectly. Uh, marvelous accomplishments and uh, terrific impact and thank you. Thank you, Marty. I want to say one last statement, which is telehealth is not here to stay. It's just going to be part of our way of doing our healthcare and providing care for patients. We won't see tele anymore after a few years. Uh, this is just using the technology and the tools as our provider communities have always done so to care for patients. It, it is another tool, right? Uh, another technology, another tool. And I think you're exactly right. We've seen other industries. Uh, we don't see e-commerce anymore, right? It's right. just commerce or e-retail or whatever, or e-shopping. It's just shopping. And the same thing, right? This is a powerful new tool that helps us deliver better care uh, more effectively and more efficiently. And with that, we'll leave you. And uh, thanks again. Um, enjoy the rest of the day. Mm -hmm.